It has been a week. It's always been a week, but but what a week. Um, on the personal side, there's something I haven't uh, shared with most of you is that um, my mother is diagnosed as being positive with COVID. Uh, she's in a nursing home in Georgia, and uh, she's been in quarantine now for about a week. Her oxygen levels are okay, other symptoms not so good, but um, for her uh, 82 years old and all the health issues that she's uh, suffered in the past, she's doing all right. So that was part of my week anyway. Um, really kind of an amazing arc of a week, starting with Martin Luther King Day on Monday, unless I'm conflating weeks, that's right, right? Wasn't MLK on Monday, yeah. And then a um, seemingly peaceful transfer of power, as they call it, on, on Tuesday, the, the inauguration, or Wednesday, um, the inauguration. Um, and then I was invited on Friday to sit in on a session with the poet David White, uh, which was was interesting. Um, so, you know, and then there's our time together, book club. It was a peaceful transfer of thoughts and reflections <laughs> on Tuesday evening. This is when I really wish I were in the room with you and I could hear, you know, chuckles or see looks of dismay, but uh, hopefully that brings a smile to everyone, everyone's face. So there's a lot there and you know, sometimes depending on, uh, you know, how we, what we wanted to have happen in an election, a week like this is, is a week of celebration or not. But there's still a lot to, to dive into. I thought I would attack this or approach this um, very traditionally with a con. And some of you um, have just begun con study. Some of you are early in it. Some of you are much further along. Some of you are just sitting and have no interest whatsoever. But this is a um, koan from early in the sequence. Some of you will recognize it. Of, in the Dharmakaya koans, it's number 16. And the koan is, how do you get out of a stone grave which is locked from the outside? This is one of my favorite koans. You know, it doesn't matter where it falls in the sequence. How do you get out of a stone grave that is locked from the outside? Now, in the Dharmakaya list, that's it. I mean, that it, it says number 16, how do you get out of a grave that's locked from the outside? And that's it. Well, I did some digging of my own, um, and, and I wanted to present it along with its uh, preface, commentary, and verse. Hang in there, Galen. So let's start with the preface to the koan. Here's a preface. I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outsider agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. So the preface to our koan today comes courtesy of Martin Luther King. That's from a letter from a Birmingham jail penned in August 1963. Um, I'm not connected to many of you on Facebook, but uh, those that you, those that are, you'll saw that I posted the entire text of this very long letter that was written in longhand. I'm con cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. 
Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. So the case itself, number 16, how do you get out of a stone grave that is locked from the outside? I found some commentary on this case as well. Let me, let me read the commentary to you. I have paid no tax for six years. I was put into a jail once on this account for one night. And as I stood considering the walls of solid stone, two or three feet thick, the door of wood and iron a foot thick, and the iron grating which strained the light. I could not be help, I could not help being struck with the foolishness of that institution which treated me as if I were mere flesh and blood and bones to be locked up. That's Henry David Thoreau, who gave us the commentary on this koan. I could not help being struck with the foolishness of that institution which treated me as if I were mere flesh and blood and bones to be locked up. Henry David Thoreau. I found a verse for the koan as well. How do you get out of a stone grave that is locked from the outside? Okay, so let's, uh, let's go to the verse. President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans, and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We be the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. 
and this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it act in its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. But one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the windswept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation in every corner called our country our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful when day comes we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid the new dawn blooms as we free it for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it if only we're brave enough to be it so that's that's the verse for how to, i mean if you ever wanted to know how to get out of a stone grave that's locked from the outside that is it if you want to know how to present a koan, that is it. You know, if only we're brave enough to be it. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. That's the best coaching I could give. And whether you agree or disagree, you know, with the inauguration that happened or with every single line of that poem, That kind of purity and purpose and intention is the greatest hope I have for our practice. We've got a lot of creative people in our Sangha. We have musicians and writers. We have people on the front lines, caregivers. We have teachers. Every one of us in our own ways is teaching, loving, feeding, inspiring those around us. And the whole point of sitting Zazen, the whole point of koan study, the whole point of the liturgy, the chants, the being together, the Sangha, the Dharma, the awakening called the Buddha, the whole point is what effect we have in our lives and on the lives around us. Amanda Gorman is 22 years old. She's uh, the daughter of a school teacher here in Los Angeles. Um, and she happens to be a graduate of New Road School, which is uh, the same school that Nick graduated from. So that's kind of just a nice little 
tangential touch. He's five years ahead of her, so I don't believe he he knows her. But uh, it was just you know a little moment of yeah, new roads. <laughs> but look at look at that spirit. How do you get out of a stone grave? Thoreau says, the folly of the institution that thinks that locking up my flesh and blood and bones is locking me up. That's as close as I'll come to solving the con for you. Or Thoreau, Thoreau, you know. The folly of the skin of, the bag of skin and bones being who we are. Right, Arsh and Martin Arsh, Art, Art and Marsh. I, I, that's a joke at our house, I'm sorry, just to conflate the two of you. Um, you know, the two of you and I have been around long enough to, to see this bag of skin and bones transform completely around us. Can you too, you know? It's amazing, isn't it? One day you're Roma, the next day you're Marsh, you know? And, and, and yet, as Tension would see it, say, the one that sees through these eyes and hears through these ears and touches through these hands and smells through this nose, that one, who is that one? And, do, and does that change? How do you get out of a stone grave that's locked from the outside? And this is where the invitation to Khan study, and it's by no means a requirement, um, sitting shikantaza as Marsh does, or just counting breaths, or just being part of the Sangha can be a lifelong practice. But these koans, when you when you take them and you go, what is my stone grave? Who locked it? What's the outside? What's the inside? Who am I? As Thoreau questioned. I had the chance to, um, I have a personal connection to letter from a Birmingham jail um, cell or letter from a Birmingham jail. Some years ago, my sister lives in Birmingham and I went to visit and uh, through uh, her boss, who uh, was, I think he was on the city council at the time, uh, they, they took me there. And um, I sat in the cell from which Martin Luther King wrote this letter. And um, I asked them to, and they obliged, they closed the door and walked away and left me alone. And um, I sat there for a while and, and I knew of the letter, but I did not know the letter. So I went and found it and read it in its entirety. And each year I try to do that. Um, and I encourage you to, to do that as well. If we were to read the whole letter uh, this morning, we would be here for double time. So if you get a chance, go read it. An amazing piece of prose and an amazing piece of social action. Uh, Bernie Glassman Tetsuken Roshi was a big proponent of social action. And one of the things that he put into place as an important part of the peacemakers or peacekeepers order, peacemakers, peacekeepers, um, in uh, the East Coast was bearing witness. Now, when you sit in that jail cell, when you lie in that stone grave of your own making, you are bearing witness. You're bearing witness to what's going on in your head. You're bearing witness to your own delusions. You're bearing witness to the possibility of stepping out of that grave. I had a trip to Rwanda um, also some number of years ago and um, you know, it was flown around the country in a military helicopter by guys with machine guns and that, but um, they, they dropped us into a site, one of the genocide sites in the middle of Rwanda. 
and um, it was pretty overwhelming with mass graves and, and everything. It was a schoolyard, a school that people had been lured to by the radio broadcast as a place to come for safety. And when they arrived at the school, they were massacred in mass. And so this is now a memorial to the Rwandan genocide. And I was overwhelmed bearing witness to that and walked down a path. And as I walked down the path, I realized that an, uh, an armed soldier, a woman was following me. And she came up right behind me and I stopped and she kind of pushed me gently from behind and she's got a gun, right? She pushes me gently from behind and indicates to me to keep going down the path. And we get to this small um, building and uh, the, the building has a latch and it's wired shut with like a piece of bailing wire or a coat hanger or something. And, and she motions to me to just stay and she starts undoing this bailing wire and opens the door and shoves me in. And I'm in the middle of Rwanda. And when I got in there, and I can share these photos at some point if you want, there were these slatted low tables like beds of corpses, limed corpses from the genocide. And I realized that she was asking me to bear witness. And I um, fell to my knees pretty much like in shock and, and overwhelm. And then I did the only thing that I could figure to do is I picked up my camera and started shooting, which I discovered later is actually uh, something well known to journalists and photojournalists is that the camera can create enough distance so that you can actually bear witness that you can record it for others. So I think it's important to step into those stone graves and to see what is there. It's important as we look at what's going on in our world to sit Zazen, to get really clear, to understand where you are in it. And then what action do you take? Um, Martin Luther King says, in any nonviolent campaign, notice nonviolent, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive, negotiation, self-purification, and then direct action. You know, that's a pretty rigorous formula. Collection of the facts. Negotiation, you give it a go. Self-purification, who are you, where are you? What is delusion? What is truth for you? And then direct action accordingly. I'm, I'm so inspired by um, Amanda Gorman, this young woman. You know, I mean, and uh, yesterday we had a, a Jukai class uh, with Tenshin Roshi and, and 32 people. And, and one of the things came up was, um, why are there always verses with koans? You know, and, and the power of poetry versus talking. And um, it's an, it was an interesting discussion that, you know, often in talking, we're describing things. Whereas poetry, like koan study, is a pure ev ev evocation. A pure evoking of what is so. You know, and, and as I said, you know, agree or disagree with some of the points in the poem, but there is pure that's a pure play, you know, from, from her heart to ours. I know we're watching a little bit more than we, we normally do, but I, I want to just underscore this point of, do you have the courage to see, do you have the courage to be um, with this interview?
Now, yesterday, this is exciting, our next guest, who is only 22 years old, performed her poem, The Hill We Climb, at President Biden's inauguration. It was breathtaking. Have a look. We, the successors of a country in the time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And I am so honored to say that she's here on the show. Please welcome the incredible Amanda Gorman, everybody. <laughs> Amanda, I am so ridiculously happy to talk to you tonight on the show. How are you? I am amazing. I'm 10 times better because I'm talking to you. You are like my favorite human being ever. You are. That is such a lovely thing for you to say. Now, let's talk. Thank you. Let's talk about yesterday. Well done. Well done. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you so much. The grace with which you spoke, I found incredibly profound. And in a moment, it felt like you captured so much of how so many people were feeling and you captured a, a, a nation's heart. How are you processing this last 24 hours and the mass of positive attention that is being bestowed on you? I don't think I really can process it to kind of give you a metaphor for that. My phone is like on fire. Like it is <laughs> so hot. It just like gave up on itself like three hours ago. And for you to understand that I was outside in the cold and my phone was that hot with the amount of support and just love that was coming from my words. And that was just incredible. You know, honestly, it's a personal honor for me to be, you know, the novel poet, to be the youngest, but I think it was something beyond that, beyond myself, a moment for the country and the world to really move forward and to be, you know, a small part in that, like, that's all anyone can ask for. But I don't think you were a small part in it. I thought, I think you were, for <laughs> me, you were the moment in it. You were the, the pivotal moment. Now, I know that your, your mother is a, a teacher right here in Los Angeles. She must be beyond proud of, of you. She I imagine so every proud. day, but today particularly. Right. This is one of those days where I can, like, unabashedly be like, so, you know, I need a new iPhone. <laughs> and get it, like, you have to capitalize on these days with your mothers. Um, but, no, I, I finished my poem, and I came up to her, and she was just sobbing, and we were trying to, like, keep it together. I was like, we are in front of the world and next to J-Lo. Like, let's keep her act together, but she's so proud. I mean, so talk to me about... The journey to, to how how do you become a poet for the presidential inauguration? Who who reached out to you, and when 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 did people reach out to you? I'm very fortunate in that um, Dr. Biden, first lady now, saw a poem that I recited at the Library of Congress in which I wore yellow, and she just really loved my performance, and so. Turns out I ended up being her first choice for an inaugural poet, and I basically get the Zoom call at the end of December. And I knew I'd been on like the long list and then the short list and the shorter list for a while, and I was just keeping my fingers crossed. I just felt, you know, I felt personally I had a very small chance of getting the opportunity because I was like, I'm 22. And, you know, I've overcome a speech impediment. Like, who would want me on stage? Um, and then they Zoom called me, you know, offered me the opportunity, and I like, danced around in my socks like a crazy person. And what's going through your head when you step up and you're, and you're looking out over the, the empty National Mall? Can you, can you remember the, what you were feeling at that moment? It's... You know, and this is something to say as a poet, it was, I think, one of those moments in my life that was beyond words. And that's saying something for me. Um, looking out, for me, I'm the descendant of a slave who's also named Amanda. So looking out and seeing, you know, the Lincoln Memorial, looking out and seeing the Washington Monument, seeing the flags laid um, in remembrance of those lost to COVID, it's a breathtaking moment. And on the other hand, you have all, like, the human anxieties, like, um, I'm cold, and I know Biden is right behind me. How does my hair look? Um, my nose is sniffling. Um, don't trip. Don't mess up. And so you kind of have to let go of all of that and just let yourself be a vessel for the poem. 
And you really were. I would cut in and say something really quickly because I would be remiss if I don't mention this. Growing up in LA, me and my sister used to always um, take the bus to the Grove on weekends and we'd always pass by um, CBS when the show was filming and we'd put our faces to the little like iron gate and be like, James Corden is inside. Maybe we should like sneak in and say hi. And we never did because we didn't want to be those two black girls who got arrested trying to like sneak in to give you a hug. So this is really a full circle moment for me. Let me tell you, you are welcome any, any time. I promise you that. I promise <laughs> you that now i know that you you wrote the poem you wrote some of the poem two weeks ago while the while the riots were happening uh, right. at the capitol how did that day affect the poem and, and you finishing it and the, what was it like to be standing in the very spot where that was happening right. reading the work that you wrote whilst you were watching that unfold on tv Mm -hmm. That's a great question. When, you know, the insurrection happened at the Capitol, I had been writing the poem for a while and like fits and starts and I saw the news and I basically locked myself in my apartment for the next whatever many hours into the night to finish it. Um, not necessarily because I was surprised at what had happened. I think we've seen the signs and the symptoms of this for a long time coming, but because I felt that it underscored for me the importance of having such a poem at the inauguration of having that moment. It was something that I needed, it was something the country needed, it was something that the world needed. And so that's how I got to work. And so as I stood in this place, I was thinking, here is basically a chapel that has been violated. And the way in which we bring that um, sagacity, that type of sacredness back to the space is in our actions and in our words. And words is where I operate and where I can make magic happen. So it was more so my calling of using my hand to try to kind of re-purify that space. Uh, you're so impressive. You're so impressive. It's, I don't think you understand what you, just talking to you now, the, the volume of hope that I, I, I feel you are giving to, to so many people I, I really really mean that i mean at the very least you've made poetry cool to so many young people out there i mean if you had what's something you you would like young people who perhaps i mean there's a very real chance that for lots of young people watching your poem today was the first time they've experienced poetry in that form what would you what's something you would want them to know about the yeah. arts of poetry that's a phenomenal question. For me, it's to know that poetry and art in general means showing up with your best self, whoever that may be, and that in itself is beautiful. You know, hearing you talk about the grace in which I performed my poem, as someone who's had to like work for years to overcome a speech impediment, that means everything to me. It means that I can still show up and carry this history and this background with me and still be more than worth it and more than enough and i hope that that's what other young people see from this today whether you're a poet or not an artist a dancer a late night host like the more that we can bring our authentic selves with hope into the moment the more that moment will show up for us now later this year uh you you're releasing your first children's book which is called change sings and yeah. yesterday it went to number one on the amazon book charts <laughs> Um, yes. I can't wait to read it to my kids. What is the message of the book? You know, what's so, you know, incredibly um, special for me is I wrote Shane Sings over a year ago. I was kind of preempting. I was like, January 2021 is going to come, and either kids are really going to need, like, a pick-me-up, or they're really going to need something that can help kind of summarize the change that we just saw. I was like, it can go anyway. And so I wrote Change Sings because I wanted children to see themselves as real change makers. I didn't want their to be like another children's book where they were like observers to the change that was happening and they were kind of powerless to kind of um, the socio-political environments or things that were going on. I wanted them to see themselves at the forefront and as the voices of tomorrow so that when little kids read it, they can say, look, there is someone in this page who looks as young as me and who looks as new as me who's using their voice. That's so wonderful. Can I ask one more thing? When when you finish, you finish the poem and the inauguration's done, 
Where do you go then? Like, what's the stuff that we don't see on TV? Do you go into a room and you're just hanging out with ex-presidents and things like that? Like, what happens then? Um, well, it's really strange because you're all just, like, at the platform and you're like, oh, we're not going to talk about the fact that Barack Obama's right there. Like, am I not about to go snap a photo with Michelle Obama? So it's basically me being like, well, I guess we're here, Lady Gaga, and, like, making a beeline for her and just, like, we were both crying and both weeping and she was so sweet. And so I think, I can't speak to other inaugurations, but despite the six feet distance in the mask, I want to say there was, like, a higher intimacy in this one where I have like Barack Obama just like standing next to me being like, you make us proud, you know, did a good job. Like in his characteristic voice, it was great. Um, I didn't want to leave and then Secret Service was like, no, really, like you got to go. <laughs> can I tell you this? I'm, I'm can I'm I not, tell you I'm something? Good. Can I tell you something? And I, 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 I really mean this. I, then I think it's, I think it's, I think you can do whatever you want. I think you can choose whatever path in your life. I think whatever you do, it's going to be rich and meaningful uh, for whoever is around you, for people that you know and you don't know. I genuinely feel like there's a very real world where there's a poet speaking at your inauguration day when you're the president <laughs> of the United States. I'm not joking. I'm, that's 100%. Do you feel this, Rich? 100%, yes. Is that something you'd want to do? Oh, heck yeah. Plan it on it. Ladies and gentlemen, the incredible Amanda Gorman, everybody. All right. I know that was a bit lengthy, but I'm not sure I could match that teaching. Great. It's hard to put a moment like the one we as a country are in right now. To Hang wars. on. But today, an extraordinary. You know, bring your best self, your authentic self in the moment. You know, I mean, we can't claim Amanda for Zen, but boy, what a perfect expression of our practice and the hope of it. You know, and, and that courage and, and just the step, stepping out of the stone grave into count on it. I will be president. This young woman. Yeah. So how do you get out of a stone grave locked from the outside? Preface, commentary, and verse. All right. Over to you guys. Any comments, questions, observations? Step out of the stone grave. <laughs> Go, Paul. Yeah, do you just unmute yourself. It's much easier that way. Uh, the uh, Just to... Um lift up what you were saying about uh, Thoreau. He was imprisoned, as I'm sure many of you know, because he refused to pay the poll tax that was um, being used to support the Mexican-American War, which he stood against. And so I love that type of, of resistance and um, bringing his true self to a very precise type of resistance. So thank you very much for um, uplifting that uh, quotation when talking about MLK's call for resistance. Sure, Paul. Thanks. Go, Melissa. Um, just as kind of a quick commentary, but I think it's really interesting this dharma talk and like the, the 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 idea of being true to ourselves and present and clear and expressive on what we believe or what we resist juxtaposed against last week's which was about the capital storming and us having space around people who actually believe differently no so it's like it's like it's i feel like true the dharma really is both like being clear to yourself and who you are and what you're bringing and being present, but also having space for others and what they're bringing, even if it's a different idea. 
So it just, I just liked, I liked that last one. And then this one coming afterwards, cause they can work in harmony. Um, but it's just an interesting thing to think about. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and Melissa, you, you actually jumped back two weeks because, <laughs> because last week was actually uh, Fandango at the wall. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. Which, which when you, when you look at it is when there's a wall. <laughs> right you know, when when there's a stone grave when there's a wall how do you approach it yeah. is it impenetrable or not you know where where does self begin and end and you know how do you transcend those barriers now i know inaugural poets and and musicians and all that it gets politicized because you know you're invited to speak for a particular party that won. And so it's almost inevitable that some will see her message as a message from the left. But I think actually, if you took her in that message and, and put it in an inauguration for the right, it could ring just as true. You know, in terms of a belief in the country and what it could be. Okay, and I'm not supporting endorsing or condemning either side here but I, just, I think it's interesting because she's being amanda she's coming out of her experience and what she believes is right and just now I, you know i happen to find it very inspiring i hope it worked for some of you too Lori has joined us Hi guys. here for a few minutes she's in she's in another training in the other room so <laughs> we've got lots of stuff going on here at <laughs> mount washington Anybody else? Ken, you reaching for it? There you go. Yeah. Good morning, all. Nice seeing all of you again. Um, what I remember was how ordinary and inconsequential Thoreau's cabin felt to me when I was at Walden Pond. I walked around this little where his cabin was, and it's, it's about as big as my room. It's set up away from the beach. We were there to swim in Walden Pond. And I trekked up and walked around it and just looked at it. And I nothing could have been more ordinary. And yet nothing could have been more consequential to the history of this of this nation. And I was struck with both sides of that coin, you know? And then I went swimming in the pond. And all I could think of was, wow, I'm, I'm swimming in Walden Pond. This is Walden Pond. And I felt like turning to the people who were lying on the beach and parking in the parking lot, I'm like, folks, this is Walden Pond. <laughs> and yet it was an ordinary day, an ordinary park, at ordinary trees, an ordinary pond, but at the same time, on the other side of that coin, here was history. And, and that's what I felt like uh, in living in Massachusetts, especially Boston. My God, you can't walk anywhere without stepping on someone, on Paul Revere's footsteps, you know? It, it was crazy. The juxtaposition of absolutely ordinary life and world changing life, you know? So th that was what I, what I got that, that afternoon at Walden Pond. And then the other thing that, that um, reading the, uh, the letter from the Birmingham jail that you posted was that someone had posted earlier in the week, or maybe it was last week, you know, what's the opposite of peace? And to me, the opposite of peace is injustice. It's not war, it's injustice. And I believe Martin Luther King may have said the same thing. And others in um, nonviolent movements might have said the same thing. And um, to me, injustice, which was mentioned in her poem by word, is really, you know, the, 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 
the vortex we've got to we've got to really address. You know what her poem brought up for a lot of people were, you know, reparations, um, 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 restoration, you know, rejuvenation of the idea of what this nation is supposedly stands for. And so that listening to her uh, that afternoon, you know, all of this was just whirling around in front of me, and. Um, I thought that her poem was an incredible distillation of history, current events, and well, a future, but a non-attachment to that future. In other words, hope can't attach itself to any skirt, you know, or to any coat. You know, hope happens at the moment. And so that's what I got from, you know, what happened four days ago, five, it seems like last year. But um, yes, peace and justice, the same coin. Thank you all. Thank you, Ken, Laurie. I, I just, I'm really present to how important it is. And I feel like all of these pieces that that because of course I know what Dan's talking about today because we talk about it beforehand and um, we live together and I feel like all of these pieces really point to we have to do our personal work and people often wonder well what can I do we have to do we have to manage all of this all of the stuff in ourselves that's why it makes us cry when it does. That's why it makes us proud when it does. Because we're ready. <laughs> we're gonna do it. And now's the time. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't have to cry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Crying's good. <laughs> Mark, that's a far away look. <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, with, with everything that's been going on lately, I haven't been further from accepting of those. And I, I think it has a lot to do with the koan that we've been working on, right? Is through the last four years and, and even before that, through the eight years of, of Obama, right? It was so separate, right? This just huge divide that I just, I, I couldn't understand, right? Having, having an Obama sticker on my car and living up in, in Simi Valley and, and having things thrown at our car and, and having people scream at us that, you know, he's not their president, which, was crazy how quickly that turned once Trump became president, right? <laughs> you need to you need to accept this president. He's everybody's president. And just the divide was so massive through all of it for me. And and it was it was us and them for so long. And then at the pinnacle of just how horrible it got, right? People are you know police that and and all these people that are screaming the thin blue line you know, stuff. And all of a sudden they're attacking the police because they disagree. And at the moment when I feel like it couldn't get any worse, right? These people are trying to overthrow our government. And that's what it took for me to not feel separate from these people, right? Like at, at that point, I understood and connected with the frustration of what's going on. You know, and it's it's so easy for us to. I, and and I don't know if this is related to the koan, but but the way I connect to it is right is we're inside that that grave that's locked from the outside. You know, we put ourselves there. We put ourselves there with people that agree with us. And to to make it outside of that in a moment where it would be so easy to be like, these people are fucking crazy. But to, to actually 
feel more connected with them at that point than at, at any time in the last 12 years was it's it's been surreal you know and and i and i agree with you like i love that that we did the uh, the reading of the poem because in jukai when they said that right like words words are not going to do it you need to use those words to evoke the feelings that that go with it right you need to it, it's really hard for me to put into words at this moment but that's that's it's really been perfect right to just end where we are right now has just been perfect and that's why i'm just kind of like sitting at it you know and it's just it's it's really it's really beautiful thank you for for today's talk i appreciate it thank you mark and and thanks for your hard hard work mark mark is um in his uh, own personal koan study, he is, he is tenacious uh, beyond beyond belief. He doesn't care whether I pass him or not. He'll just keep going if he needs to keep going. So um, anyway, well well done, Mark, and thank you for your your commentary here. I mean, I think most of you probably have some sense of you know where I fall on point of view on some things. But I'm always working, and I think it's really important, as Mark has said, and I can't get him off full screen here, so you're just going to have to live with you there for a while, Mark. Um, but um, it, it's really important to understand those thick walls and, and how we build them. And I told the story about my brother-in-law, you know, uh, the Trump supporter and Nick's and my trip to uh, Birmingham and not knowing how he was going to respond, you know, with Nick being gay and everything. And then he just reached out with open arms and said, it's so good to see you. It's been way too long. And just the love coming from the other was, was completely disarming. Hey, Rich, welcome. And, um, you know, welcome to the, to the fray. Uh, you don't, need to jump in at all but i just want to make sure that you're acknowledged and it's nice to have you with us and um if you want to add anything feel free to otherwise just hello and everybody wave hi philip oh um yeah, I'm always happy to, you know, babble on. Uh, yeah, uh, while you were talking, I wrote down this, that you are a thief. You are a thief that stole a dead body from a grave and you brought it back to life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoy reading the stuff and, and studying, uh, you know, what people wrote a thousand, more than a thousand years ago. And it's real nice. Um, but uh, we're living here. We're alive now, you know. And uh, I, I, I remember I, I, when you're like, okay, you can get this book if you want or this book. And, and I bought the wrong version of the Blue Cliff records and it was like so complicated and I didn't and I was like oh my god this is so esoteric like I don't really understand like how it connects to it's, it was hard for me to connect it with life you know and uh, if we're not able to uh, actualize our practice then this practice is dead you know there's no point in doing any of it and uh, I, I, <laughs> I love the verse and commentary for this call. <laughs> so uh, thank you. It feels, feels very alive and well. So that's all I got to say. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. And, and I'm, I'm glad you, you, you get it, Philip, because, you know, I have fun with this, too. It's like, OK, we've got this ancient practice and it's got all the form and the bells. We did you know a traditional service this morning. I think I missed just a couple of cues. 
But, you know, how, how do you, for each of us, how do we, you know, manifest it? How do we bring it to life in, in a way that makes sense today? So, yeah, I mean, I'm having fun over here, too. I'm like, I know that I want to do this con, but like, you know what? And then I, and I just start poking around. I'm like, well, wait a minute. We got a verse. We got a commentary. We got, you know, because there it is. So I encourage, I encourage you and everybody on, on all of these is not to take it by rote, but to look at it. And, and, you know, poetry is like that anyway, right? Poetry is so evocative and so nonlinear. You kind of need to go to that place with poetry. What does it mean to me? What does it bring out in me? What does it illuminate about this moment in my life right now? You know, Otherwise, it's just rhythm and rhyme or not rhyme. And, and that's, that's a perfect way to hold this practice too. follow the form, learn what there is to learn, chant the liturgies, be in Sangha. You know, where are the vestments? Then what happens when you walk out the front door? And this bearing testament bearing witness thing i i just highly encourage it it's you know i do this all the time that's why when Lori and i were invited to meet with former president george bush we were like yes you know because like you know how often do you get that chance somebody that's a news story go meet him go talk to him shake his hand share a cup of coffee see what's there see what's there in yourself tetsigan bernie took people to Auschwitz in the concentration camps and did sessions at the concentration camps for that reason. And he took people onto the streets of New York to pretend they were homeless for a few days for that reason. Step over those lines, step out of the grave, make it yours. So thanks, Philip. And, th and thanks for appreciating the, the fun of it. Mm -hmm.